All right, good morning traders. My name is Christopher Vecchio, Senior Currency Strategist with Daily Effects. Today is Monday, February 27th, 2017. I'm here to take you through the next 30 minutes or so as we discuss the uh, top events in the week ahead. Uh, if I sound out of it, I do apologize. I'm getting over a little bit of a stomach bug from this weekend, so my voice has been shot from screaming at the porcelain god, as I like to say, and I'll keep it in simple terms. Um, but as always, if you have any of the comments or questions, feel free to put them in the uh, chat box at any point in time. If you're looking for trade-specific insight, please include your entry stop and time frame so I know where you've gotten into the market, where your risk lies, and what your point of view is, of course. Um, beyond that, please be aware that any opinion I disseminate is mine and mine alone. It does not constitute trade advice on behalf of daily effects or IG group, so please don't treat it as such. Um, first things first, for those that are around, uh, I know a lot of people here in the United States saw that their accounts may have been switched over um, over the weekend or on Friday at, at market close uh, to forex.com. That's run by Gain Capital, so if you head over to the forex.com website, uh, Gain Capital's website, you'll be able to access your account if you've been previously a, a client of FXCM. Um, Forex.com is the website that I was able to look at and uh, access my account from. So I assume it's the same for everyone, if you're, especially if you're a US-based trader. Um, otherwise, proceed as you were. Just a little programming note there for, again, those that may have been affected by some of the recent news. Uh, beyond that, though, I think it's a, a really important week this week when we talk about you know the, the economic calendar. This week is certainly more saturated than weeks past. Let me just pull this up here. All right, economic calendar this week. Taking a look at the weekly view, of course, and we're going to want to filter out the low and medium events, and there are several high events over the course of this week. Uh, we're not going to have time to talk about all of them, so we're only going to highlight the ones that we feel are top tier, if you will. Um, today's durable goods order is coming out at about 53 minutes, which certainly qualify. I don't really think the USGDP report tomorrow is all that important, considering it's a second reading, right? We already know what's going on there. Uh, but Australian GDP, very important. U.S., excuse me, uh, uh, Chinese manufacturing PMI, important. We could talk about the State of the Union address that President Trump will be giving in front of the joint session of Congress. Likewise, we have the Bank of Canada rate decision on Wednesday. We have the Eurozone CPI report on Thursday. We have Thursday in New York, but technically Friday in Japan and GMT, uh, the Japanese CPI. And then finally on Friday, the ISM non-manufacturing or services composite. All right. Uh, before we even touch on any of this, though, I see questions here, what's going on with the pound, and that's actually where I wanted to start today. If you take a look at a short-term chart, pound fell out of bed coming into the start of this week, and why might that be? Well. It's not actually Brexit related per se, but it looks like Scotland is going to be trying for another referendum. Now, we previously said that given the failure of the 2014 uh, referendum, that there would need to be some more certainty uh, from Nicola Sturgeon, right, the Prime Minister or head of uh, Scotland right now, that it would actually pass. This is really a generational fight at this point in time from my point of view. You have something so significant go up to the ballot more than once in a short period of time. If it fails twice in, say, three years, people are going to discredit the movement entirely for 10 or 15 years, perhaps. Now, Theresa May and Cove said, well, this is not going to happen. We're only willing to look at new Scottish referendum if uh, uh, it happens until after we leave the EU. That's exactly what Scotland wants to avoid. They don't want to you know, skedaddle. I don't know what else you could do with Brexit there, but there's your SC and uh, a term for leaving skedaddle. Um, the way I see it, this is something that's fairly important to the UK. 
talking about the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom, certainly this would reshape it. This would also give uh, an opening for, say, Northern Ireland to be reunited with the rest of Ireland. So I don't think this is simple as, you know, will they have another referendum vote? Yes, the last one was close, but I think given the context and circumstances of this now, there's a real reason why traders are fairly concerned. And along those lines, uh, if it's pound dollar, which is now at the bottom side part of uh, this triangle, if it's pound yen, which has already started to slip out of uh, its symmetrical triangle, price has been governed by this going back to December, you can see here how the pound's not looking in that great of a condition. And you know, this is one of those reasons why over the last several weeks during this euro pound potential head and shoulders formation, we've repeatedly said this is not a head and shoulders yet. Anyone who's calling it to be so is jumping the gun. We haven't gotten that confirmed break below one uh, key level, the 83.40 neckline, if you will. And I think this speaks to the fact that you have to respect the technicals here. Uh, certainly getting too excited about this at any point in time before we break 83.40 right now looks like it would be simply just a waste of capital. A lot of churning in your account where even if you played the breakout level, we're pretty much back to there right around 85.25 in this initial bear flag. So uh, the way I see it, it's still too early to call this head and shoulders pattern in Euro pound. It's worth watching, but not so uh, uh, actionable. Um, Bradley's saying he's getting a little bit of an audio issue. Is everything else working clear for everyone? I just want to be able to send him a note that everything's fine. You can simply type Y or yes into the chat box if you're good. Everyone says good, so let me just type a note here to Bradley. All right, thanks for your confirmation there. Um, so I want to talk about that, that Scottish referendum and how it's impacting the pound today, obviously throwing a wrench into euro pound here, and that's something that we should monitor in the, uh, in the near term. All right, so keeping this in mind, um, let's start talking about some of this data that's due out over the coming days. Uh, today, we have U.S. durable goods coming out. That, to me, is one of the more important data releases for the United States. Durable goods are like retail sales, except for Therefore, goods that have lifespans of three years or more. That's what a durable good is. And, and when we're talking about durable goods, we're saying things like washers and dryers and dishwashers, refrigerators, right? If you think about it, those are the type of items that people just don't buy in any given month. In fact, you don't buy them all that frequently at all, to, to be honest. Those type of outlays, aircraft, etc., are only made when there's significant financial certainty in the future. You don't drop... $500, $1,000 on a new washer and dryer if you think that you're going to lose your job next month. That's just simply not how people make decisions. So um, today's data is actually supposed to be pretty encouraging given the fact that we're looking for durable goods orders to increase for the first time in two months, 1.6% estimate from negative 0.5, excluding transportation, which is a durable good, right? 0.5% uh, gain. Capital goods, 0.5% gain. Uh, durable goods were much weaker than anticipated back in December, and they fell by half a percent, and this was caused by a slump in defense aircraft orders. But the general trend really is that new orders and shipments have improved in recent months, following a long period where business spending has struggled as the significant, significant correlation, really above 0.8%, um, with industrial production has taken a toll on activity. So we've seen industrial production fall, no surprise, Durable goods have slipped as well, but according to our recent ISM meetings, uh, ISM readings, excuse me, uh, new orders have edged up, despite the fact that export orders have remained somewhat weak. I would think that's attributed to the stronger U.S. dollar. Obviously, if you're a foreigner, you're trying to buy U.S. goods. A stronger U.S. dollar deters you from wanting to purchase American-made goods. One thing to keep an eye on here is that we're looking at the numbers for mining investment because that's where there's been a significant decline in turnaround um, the last several months. But recent indications, particularly from the mining sector, suggest that we should see a continued demand, uh, recovery in demand for CAPEX, capital expenditures. So along those lines, 
Uh, I think today we may see actually a little bit of a dollar bounce around the data. Um, when we take a look at what's been going on with the greenback, you know, this price action here hasn't been all that clear, but there is a concern to watch out for, right? We had this uh, inverted hammer from February 15th that came right back up to the swing levels from mid-January. On our recent run higher here on the daily trade, you can see this evening star candle cluster. When we go down to a four-hour time frame, you could see how on this four-hour time frame, we really were making an attempt to climb back over the ascending trend line from the February lows. We failed to do so. This back test led us to actually putting in a lower high than what we saw in mid-February. Now, this could simply be the beginning of a triangle, right? I don't want to dismiss that as a possibility as well. Uh, but certainly would want to keep an eye on DXY today. See that it's able to maintain its rally above last week's swing low. Have to look like that on Friday we put in this outside engulfing bar, taking out all of the previous periods high and low. Uh, and, and right now I would think that the market still may be tilted to the top side. When you look at Fed funds rate expectations, as it were, you can see that the market itself is pricing in still less than a 40% chance of a uh, rate hike next month. When I say next month, that's about two days away. Um, but I still think there's room for that to improve. I'm not totally convinced the Fed's going to do anything, only because given their series of commentary and the concerns that they've issued and how they failed to materialize so far, I'm of the mindset that they're probably going to wait until at least May or June now. They've already announced, uh, pre-announced some changes to their policy, right? They're going to go ahead with fan charts going forward as part of their uh, uh, staff economic projections to display the variability around these forecasts. Obviously, with a fan chart, if you see a tighter fan, then there's more confidence. If there's a wider fan, then that means there's a greater dispersion of estimates. So this will be a way for the Fed to try to communicate how confident they feel in various readings about the economy going forward. Durable goods, again, is a proxy for the health of the consumer, perhaps a gauge of capital expenditure confidence. If we see a rebound today, that could be one of those pieces that helps get the dollar back in the markets uh, a forefront, if you will, for, for future gains given the potential outcome and implications for that FOMC meeting. Um, when we're talking about other upcoming U.S. data this week, right, tomorrow's State of the Union address by President Trump is actually fairly important, right, because we've heard so much talk about tax plans and infrastructure spending and the Affordable Care Act replacement. I'm of the mindset that the market may be waiting on some of those details as well, and if that's the case, I don't think that we're going to see anything too colorful, right? We'll, we'll get a lot of talk and discussion, but in terms of filling in the details about those specific policy plans, I'm not so sure that they'll be there, and part of that is because we've seen, at least in these news, and who knows if it's real news, if it's fake news, if it's anything in between, um, and honestly, I don't buy into that whole fake news stuff because that's, that's just a way of trying to discredit people from paying attention. But even if it's just a rumor, the rumors haven't been that the House and the Senate and the White House are all on the same page. So seeing as how that Republicans will need to come together and agree on a plan in order to get it passed into legislation before President Trump can sign it, I'm of the mindset that we're probably not going to see all that much detail tomorrow, and that could actually be something that hurts the dollar. All right. How could that hurt the dollar? Well, any signs that fiscal reform is being delayed, when we talk about our Mundell Fleming model or our, you know, going back to Econ 101, ISLM balance of payments model. For a country like the United States with high capital mobility, the dollar has been built upon this idea that 
an increase in fiscal expenditures, the combination of tax cuts plus government spending vis-a-vis -vis infrastructure spending, that would lead to increased inflationary pressures. Generally speaking, deficit spending increases inflationary pressures, right? So you have increased deficit spending, higher inflationary pressures, that leads to a situation where the Federal Reserve needs to tighten policy and raise rates. So any sign, much like what we saw in the beginning of January, where it became clear that the timeline for this wasn't going to be right away, that fiscal authorities would not simply, just because Republicans had control of everything, they'd be able to get a plan together right away. That's hurt the dollar somewhat. It's more or less, let me take some of these off here, put you on there. Whereas right around the election and soon after, rising short-term yields, this is the two-year yield, went hand-in-hand hand with the dollar index rally. You could see that they've more or less decoupled this month. And so I think part of that is tracing in you know, two Fed rate hikes this year. Notice how we're sitting near the lower part of our range. We can actually just go over to a U.S. two-year yield chart. And depending upon how you measure it, again, teach their own. But the way I see it is that we haven't really made a substantive break higher here. And yes, we've started to move more sideways. That's certainly welcome development. We lost the downtrend aspect of recent price action. But nevertheless, our condition holds. U.S. yields have stopped advancing. And part of that may be the fact that this tailwind of an expedited fiscal reform package coming through just seems to be of a smaller probability right now. If we do get details, and I'm wrong, which is you know always a possibility, as I like to say, I'm wrong quite often, just ask my wife, that if two-year yield bounces, then I'm very much inclined to think that the dollar gets to bounce. But again, we're going to need to see some meat on those bones. We can't just have more. You know, this tax plan is going to be huge. Uh, it's going to be the greatest thing ever. You know, if any, we get any more of that, then the market's going to you know, call the bluff. One situation that I'm keeping an eye on is with your dollar, and uh, Yvago is asking, you know, what could hurt the dollar that could see your dollar trade back up towards 110? I'll tell you what, I don't think the dollar versus the euro is going to be the place to express any dollar negative views right now in the run-up to the French elections and the Dutch elections first, which are coming up in a few weeks, but then French elections in April and May, only because of the outlier political risk that this poses. You know, it really is an existential threat to the EU. You know, everyone says, like, oh, it's not a big deal if France lose the EU. Well, you know, pardon my condescension, but, excuse me, sports fan, but what's your understanding about European history, right? Not anyone asking you asking the question, but Generally speaking, these people saying that it wouldn't be a big deal. You know what most of these people, they don't have degrees in you know, political theory. They don't have degrees in history. I know someone who does, though. Oh, that's me. Okay, so you go back to 1947, right, right after 1948 with the Treaty of Rome and the end of World War II, the European coal and steel community is formed so that Germany and France are bound together at the hip so that these two great powers stop fighting. Now it's not to say that if France leaves the EU that they're going to go to war with Germany. What I'm saying is that the EU has been the cornerstone for peace in Europe for the last 70 plus years. And if you go back historically, you go back to the 13th century, you won't find another significant set of time lasting more than about 40 or 50 years in which there is sustained peace in Europe. So the EU has been the hallmark, the cornerstone of what's been a historically significant period of peace in the Western world. Without it, it wouldn't happen, period. It's just not in the human nature, all right? So to simply say France leaving the EU is not a big deal, 
throws away and spits on historical precedent of World War One and World War Two. All right. Now, do I think the EU and the Euro are perfect institutions? No, by no means, okay? Germany has a ridiculous unfair advantage from having the Euro this week. Not just with respect to the United States and the trade deficit that the U.S. runs with Germany, but within the rest of the EU itself, okay? The fact that Germany could be using a Euro near 128 or 130 based on purchasing power probably keeps the Euro higher than it should be for many other countries. I know Italy and Spain and Greece would love to have the euro trading near like, you know, 0.8 or 80 cents on the dollar. And it's the fact that the euro has stayed so strong, which has created some of these structural imbalances in these southern European economies. They need fiscal integration, something they don't have yet. So there are problems and there are legitimate issues that need to be solved if this is going to last long term. But to simply throw it away without attempting to solve the issues, particularly from one of the two major countries in which this whole concept is built upon, I think is a rather short-sighted and quite frankly asinine view of history. And so I can't respect it because it shows a, just a complete disrespect for uh, those that have come before us and what they've sacrificed to bring us here. I think, I hope that people come together and the Germans especially realize that they can't, can't keep towing this line of fiscal responsibility when they themselves have contributed to the reason why Greece is still in the hole that it is. So these years ahead are going to be, uh, you know, not easy, and they haven't been easy the last few years, and Greece is now in a bit of a recession that's proven to be longer than the U.S. Great Depression. And then you also factor in, you know, the brain drain that's gone on. They've lost about 500,000 people since about 2008. You know, these are the people that can afford to leave, that have job opportunities elsewhere, where they have family that's emigrated elsewhere. Not to be discouraging, but these probably are people that are more well-to-do, higher education, better jobs. That really is a concern that I have for countries that are going through these prolonged depressions. And that's what really is going on with Greece right now. It's a depression. Germany really needs to give some leeway if this experiment in democracy is going to work. And I think that the Dutch elections and the French elections coming up, they pose too much of a significant threat in the near term to even get the market thinking about a substantial Eurodollar rally, as it were. That said, if we get through April and you know Emmanuel Macron is the French president, if we don't see that Trump has put together any semblance of a concerted fiscal plan with Congress, yeah, you've got me sold on your dollar rallying, but just not right now. Okay. I see in the short term here that there may be some opportunity, if you will, for your dollar maybe basing. I think a little bit more patience would be required, honestly, before we get too far ahead of ourselves. Right, depending on how you cut it. I think there are better places to express uh, maybe a Euro bullish view, although I'm not really expressing a Euro bullish view right now. I, I prefer to wait until we get through some of this near-term potential for calamity. Um, swinging over to look at Aussie dollar, we can talk about dollar CAD shortly. Aussie dollar to me has this GDP reading coming up. And let's put this up here. Great. Aussie to me looks like it's becoming increasingly vulnerable ahead of this uh, uh, GDP reading. And I say that because when we look at the situation that the Australian economy is in, and really the Aussie dollar is in, we haven't seen that great of data outside trade. We had a big trade balance figure for the end of, at the end of the year last year, but that could be something that helps push up GDP. 1.9% um, due from 1.8% expected. Is that something that's going to excite market participants about getting back in on long Aussie positions? 
Not necessarily. Um, keep in mind that we did just have a set of data out last week that could give us a clue as to what Aussie GDP may be. They may actually be lower. Now remember the Q3 GDP reading came in negative. Quarter over quarter was negative 0.5%. Most banks, particularly those that are exposed to Australia, are saying that it could be a touch weaker because of the CAPEX data that we saw. If that's the case, we are in a pretty significant zone of resistance here in Aussie dollar. We are banging up into the 77, 77, 75 area back since August. More recently, and even getting rid of the wedge-like behavior that price has been exhibiting the last few weeks. Something that I've just taken note of is that Aussie dollar since January 4th until Friday had not put in a close below the daily 13 EMA. And yet we get to Friday, we put in that close below there, and it's coming on the heels of what appears to be an evening star candle cluster. So you have a potential near-term topping sign. You have price losing this moving average that's been guiding price for the past seven weeks. Aussie to me looks vulnerable here heading into this print and given the fact that we are near recent range tops, it'd be difficult for me to see a scenario in which Aussie all breaks through 77, 75. There's also signs of maybe Aussie yen working through a false breakout. And again, one of the things that we had noticed going back to October 3rd was that price had held above the daily 34 EMA on a closing basis while MACD was trading above zero. We just got our first daily close below that 34 EMA on Friday in almost four months. We had this triangle that was consolidating in the market going back to at least November. We made an attempt higher through it, but now we're back within the range. These aren't exactly encouraging signs for the Australian dollar. All right. Um, one thing I want to keep an eye on this week as we look at the Bank of Canada rate decision on Wednesday would be oil. Because BOC finds itself in a situation where growth is still fairly underperforming. Yeah, inflation is actually faster than they anticipated, but that could be due to energy prices. On the balance, I can't see that they are uh, uh, going to go ahead and actually do much of a change, right? In such a case, keeping an eye on the Canadian dollar if oil prices continue to struggle higher and the BUC basically says, look, we're, we're going to look past this recent inflation bounce, okay? Which is what they said they're going to do so far. Dollar CAD may be inclined to try to run higher. Now, the State of the Union address with President Trump will probably impact Dollar CAD. I know he says otherwise that they're going to target Mexico with a border adjustment tax. Uh, forgive me, I don't think he knows what he's talking about, the commander in tweet. A border adjustment tax is something that would apply to all goods going in and out of the country, which means Canadian goods as well. So if there's something done that levies a cost or a tax on imports into the United States, considering that Canada exports 75% of its goods to the U.S., 
I think, inclined to think that would have a negative impact on the Canadian economy. So if we see a harsh protectionist tone come out of the State of the Union tomorrow night, dollar CAD may be inclined to run to the top side again. Uh, I, I do see the potential for basing here right around 130 as we've been watching, you know, given that we had broken out of this rising uptrend, but I also see the fact that we could be in the throes of a bullish rising wedge. So you know, what we pointed out last week this time and what I still think is valid, we want to clear out that February 7th swing. That comes in at 132.12. Last week we got to 132.10. That's not quite there. A little bit of patience is worth it. But ultimately I think the Canadian dollar is at risk. I see someone who came back in late there asking if I talked about the pound already and uh, yes, so just to quickly recap, pound dollar and pound yen under pressure uh, after news of the Scottish referendum looking to be back in play. Of course, just on a technical basis, given the triangle that's forming up here over the last four months, this key reversal that we had at the start of the month has cap price, and now it looks like this triangle is starting to break lower. Pound yen, likewise, is exhibiting the same sort of behavior. Triangle starting to break lower. I do think that we're creating another wedge in here, although if we get down below 138.54, let's see if this participates. 138.54, the low that we had back on February 7th, then given the nature of price and the indicators right now, where we're starting to slip below into a little bit of a negative or bearish EMA envelope, MACD is now trending lower below that signal line as stochastics, moving lower below 50, pound yen looks like it would be a sell. In that case, if price continues to move lower, next leg up would be 136.45. At that point in time, it becomes a momentum trade, and I would just be following short to moving averages lower until we see, you know, a price or trend start to break down. You know, 8 EMA is my preferred uh, short to moving average, particularly when we're trending sharply in pound yen. You can see recently during the, the throes of the uptrend in November and December, no daily closes below that 8 EMA until we get to December 19th. And if you were using that as your guide, you know what? You did fairly well on that upswing, and you've avoided a lot of the grind lower. So keeping in line with that attitude, 8 is below the 13, which is below the 34, of course, we have the 200 day right here, but this is a market that really hasn't respected that significantly over time. So I'm not really too concerned about it right now. Again, given US yields, we've seen that pound yen has followed, along the side, many of these cross, yen crosses have followed US yields, particularly after the election. The fact that US yields are coming off probably bodes well for the Japanese yen. And if that's the case, then a pound yen decline wouldn't be out of the question further. Uh, I wouldn't say the 34 EMA is my favorite, right? I like to use a Fibonacci fan of moving averages. 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55. Okay, and then I just see what's going on with the market. I let the market tell me what it's paying attention to. I don't really care. I don't have any preference. You know, these people that are saying, like, I only use 50 and 100 and 200, you're trying to fit the market into your point of view then, right? You know, you're becoming, the, the market's then the peg and you're the hole. And you're saying, well, the market, you need to fit into my point of view, my perspective. Whereas I'm saying, like, look, I have, you, the market's the whole, I have all these different pegs. I don't care if it's a star shape or square or triangle or circular or hexagonal. 
you tell me what you want and I'll find the moving average that fits with you and I'll watch that one. There's no reason to be so rigid, in my, my view. So it just so happens that in a lot of these, Yen crosses 34 has been the, you know, cadence right now. Um, like Aussie Yen. It just so happens to line up this time around with no daily close until Friday, but that was October 3rd. So October 3rd until February 24th, no daily closes below that 34 EMA, and sure enough, between the false breakout on that, I think that there's some reason to be concerned about price action up here. Um, but zooming along, Chinese manufacturing PMI, 51.2 from 51.3. Again, look to Aussie dollar, Aussie yen, which we've covered extensively. We've talked about dollar CAD and the BOC. Um, ISM manufacturing for February, if that pushes higher further, manufacturing is becoming less and less of a, an important part of US GDP, but uh, given Trump's rhetoric and how he says he wants to you know, revive that part of the economy, further signs of, of growth or confidence there would certainly be welcome. Then DXY, you know, this triangle that's forming, if you will, in the four hour time frame, who knows if this is actually valid, but we're starting to see some consolidation up here, higher highs, lower highs, excuse me, higher lows and lower highs. Uh, to me, that's like a, a spring coiling. I wasn't very good at it, but I do recall from my physics tests back in secondary and university uh, that it looks like we're storing kinetic energy here. That's what a coiling spring does. We don't have this uh, uh, release of the kinetic energy yet, so right now it's just potential energy, but you know, like a coiling a spring, the tighter we push it together, uh, the greater the release will be. So, you know, right now, kind of watching this market coil together. Interestingly enough, if we were to extend this and this say this holds true, that means that this spring reaches its vertice, its breakout point, right in the middle of March. What's in the middle of March? March FOMC meeting. Right. March 15th is that FOMC meeting. And let's just, for giggles, just pull this all the way out here. Where is March 15th on our chart? Right here. right there. We could coil all the way up into March 15th, but if there is a triangle here and it is going to a breakout point, with all these expectations starting to build around that March 15th meeting, then you know what, that, that kind of makes a lot of sense that the market would be looking into there. Uh, Eurozone CPI on Thursday, 1.9% from 1.8, 0.9% expected to hold for February. Again, Euro dollar isn't Midst of this downtrend here in price, potential for a little bit of a wedge that's working its way here. On the daily chart, I can't help but feel that we saw price run into this trend line from the recent highs, and Friday we put in this inverted hammer. Indicators are now in negative territory. Price moving averages starting to resolve themselves in a more bearish manner. ECB has said that they're going to look through inflation, so all things considered, the data may not be that significant for a top side move. All right. Um, Euro yen is also making its way lower here. So Euro to me looks like it could be one of these, you know, sell the rally type opportunities. Again, Euro pound not crazy about still because I don't think there's a lot of clarity right now. Part of that is the fact that the pound is going through a little bit of a an issue here with this Scottish referendum rumor. But in the very near term, uh, this downtrend is capping price. Perhaps it's a seller rally opportunity, but I'm gonna let Euro pound continue to figure itself out, right, before we commit to anything. And if we want to, we could say that theoretically this may be more wedge-like price action. So keeping an eye on it, still a little way to go to develop. 
nothing to trade with yet, given the conflicting points of view. Finally, Japanese CPI, and we're running out of time here real quick. Uh, Japanese CPI, signs of deflation are coming back in. Everyone's starting to feel that, you know, this experiment with Japanese monetary policy hasn't worked. If we see inflation touch higher, then that's probably going to be enough to keep the yen on stronger footing. BOJ seems to be running out of tools, and more importantly, given the fact that A, they own about 40% of all outstanding Japanese government debt, and B, they're facing a situation where the United States, vis-a-vis -vis President Trump, has been uh, talking down these manipulated currencies, if you will, which the yen is very much one of. It's difficult for me to see right now how, barring a sharp turn higher in U.S. yields, the inflation data at the end of this week leads to a stronger dollar yen. Um, that said, you can see here how we're still on the outside of this trend line that governed price in the beginning of the year. And so we're back at a support region. We're still on the other side of this trend line. This could be a very low risk buying opportunity in dollar yen. The most recent pivot in this zone was from November 26, and that came in at 111.30. Six. All right. The recent lows here were about 111, 60, 55. You know, if you could take a 80 or 90 pips stop with a target of the most recent high coming in near 114.95, you have pretty good risk to reward. You need to hit one of those, you know, every three or four occasions, and you're going to be breaking even. So, ultimately, I look for good risk to reward setups. Right, not necessarily patterns. If you manage your risk, then you'll be on the right footing. Um, ISM services at the end of this week, that's going to be an important proxy for U.S. non-farm payrolls the following Friday on March 10th. Non-manufacturing or services cover about two-thirds of all jobs in the U.S. economy, so evidence that the sector is holding up and continue to expand will be welcome. Just like ISM manufacturing, just like this PMI manufacturing for China, uh, this is a diffusion index based around 50. Okay, At 50, it means that the conditions have not changed. When you're above 50, it means that you're expanding. The more, the higher you are above 50, the faster the rate of expansion. The deeper you are below 50, the faster the pace of contraction. So at 56.5, we're expecting a moderate pace of expansion. Okay, if we see it continue to evolve along those lines, given the relationship between ISM services and let's say NFPs over the last 10 years, that would roughly call for a pace of jobs growth in the 175 to 200,000 neighborhood, which to me says that if we do see another 200K NFP print, given the recent inflation readings, I think the market's really underpriced for the Fed rate hike come March. We could see something of the nature where the Fed drops its, you know, press conference, SEP, just where the Fed has only made significant decisions, just like the ECB or the BOE or the RBNZ, um, whereby they have new staff projections at a press conference to hold, you know, hold the market's hand uh, uh, through the change in policy. If the economy is moving strong enough that they feel that they need to give a rate hike off cycle, they may announce that every meeting is live going forward. And that in and of itself, despite the fact that we wouldn't see a March hike, would be considered bullish for the dollar. Okay, but seeing as how my uh, time is running out here, I do want to thank everyone for their time and attention today. Uh, I apologize about my voice. I have uh, getting over, over a little bit of a stomach bug. I held it together for this hour, so I'm going to pat myself on the back. Thank you, Pepsid and Tums, unofficial sponsors of my morning. Beyond that, I uh, want to appreciate uh, uh, everyone's questions here. If you want to get in touch with me and I didn't get the chance to answer your question, feel free to reach out to me through the Daily FX Real-Time News Feeds, Doctors, and Twitter at CVECUFX. You can always access the Real-Time News Feed by scrolling up over to, to News on the site and heading over to Real-Time News, where you find myself, among others, with data, uh, uh, with information, etc., if you will. Otherwise, you can always email me, cvecu at dailyfx.com. I'll be back on Wednesday 
with a trading Q&A, and Thursday with the Central Bank Weekly. You can always register for those webinars on the webinar page of the webinar calendar. Head on over to Trading Q&A and find me there. Other than that, good luck trading the rest of today's session, and hopefully I will talk to you soon.